All right, the patient assessment process. So this is our investigative process by which we go through and find and discover all the things that are wrong with our patient and then ultimately arrive at an avenue of treatment as to how we're going to make our patient better. So this methodology that we use when we teach the initial classes sometimes, it's simplified, it's very compartmentalized, but I think it makes it a memorable way to go through this process. So when we talk about patient assessment, we always start with this compartment called the scene size up. And during the scene size up, right, these are all the things that I need to make sure that I have to do my job in my patient assessment process. So this is the stereotypical, right, and there's six things here, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's six things here, and this is the uh, scene, scene safety, this is scene safe, do I have my BSIs, uh, how many patients am I dealing with? Is it a mechanism of injury or nature of illness? Do I need any additional resources? Remember, this isn't just ALS or manpower. We're talking about police, PEPCO, things like that. Any additional resources that I might require to run this call? Resources. And then one that gets thrown in here is C-spine precautions. And C-spine precautions are really important to utilize in this initial assessment before I've placed any hands on my patient because as I move into my what's called primary assessment, I'm going to start putting hands on my patient and manipulating them. And I don't want to do that if I have any C-spine, uh, potential C-spine injuries. So one of the things that's neat about this compartment is if we just remember that these are six things, right? These are the six things for me the six things that I need to make sure that I have in order to mitigate this call that I'm going to go on. And this is the one, you know, it starts at the, right at the dispatch, we get in the MDC, we look at the comments, and we start forming our opinions about how we're going to run this call. So that's the scene size up. The scene size up progresses into the primary assessment. And very conveniently, the primary assessment also has six points. And if this is the six for me, the six things that I need to run the call, these are the six things for the patient. So we'll say these are the six for them, right? The six for them, and that is the six things that they need to sustain life, to go on living. These are the six things we need to make sure are okay with the patient. So number one, as I approach my patient, I form my general impression of the patient. And what I do here is I simply, I paint the picture to myself, uh, general impression. So I paint a picture to myself of what my patient has going on. So in our stereotypical chest pain patient, I might say, all right, as I approach my patient uh, in the living room of a single family home, I find that my patient is sitting upright uh, on the couch in his living room, and I see him clutching his chest, demonstrating that Levine sign. Maybe he's leaning a little bit forward, and he has a look of general distress on his face. Right? That's a really uh, simple general impression. The other thing I do during my general impression is I just kind of get an overlay of the scene and I check to see if there's any obvious life threats that need to be removed before I even start working on my patient. So that's my general impression. I've now formed my general impression and now I make patient contact and I want to determine my level of consciousness. Okay, my level of consciousness. Okay, so during level of consciousness, this is my AVPU, right? Alert, verbal, painful, and unresponsive. Remember that when we get to U for unresponsive, it's unresponsive and not unconscious. There is a difference there. Okay, so I determine my level of consciousness, and then it's simply, I check my airway, breathing, and circulation requirements. Remember, if I have an unresponsive patient, I reverse this order, and it's CAB instead of ABC, but in my medical patient who's able to converse with me and speak with me, I simply go ABC. And when I check airway, okay, I need to know one of two things. Is it open or is it closed? If my airway is not patent, if it's not open, I go through these very basic measures to open my airway, either head tilt, chin lift, suctioning if that's what's required, placing the airway adjunct if that's what's needed, but I open my airway. So is it open or closed? When I assess B, uh, B for breathing, I want to know three things. I want to know what are the rate, the rhythm, and quality of those respirations. Right? So as they're breathing, keep in mind I'm not taking any vital signs during my primary assessment. I simply want to know, is my rate way too fast or way too slow? I'm not going to take the time to count this. This entire 
process of my primary assessment might take me 40 to 60 seconds. I'm not going to take the time to officially count my rate yet. I just want to know, does it appear to me, is it way too fast or way too slow? Rhythm, I want to know, is it regular or irregular? When they breathe, is it a nice rhythmic cycle, in and out, in and out? Or is it sporadic? Is it irregular? And then quality. And what quality means here under B for breathing is from where I'm standing, even without a stethoscope, do I hear any adventitious lung sounds? Can I hear strider as I approach my patient? As I approach my patient, do I hear any audible wheezing, even without the stethoscope? Okay. Notice nowhere in here am I checking pulse ox, right? I don't even care about that yet. I just want to assess these values. When I move on to C for circulation, I also want to know, very conveniently, rate, rhythm, and quality of my pulse, right? So I find my patient's pulse. I determine the rate. I don't need the exact number. I want to determine, does it feel way too fast or way too slow? Is it nice and regular or is it irregular? And the quality, is it strong or is it weak? Okay. Additionally, in our C for circulation, I also evaluate my skin. And under skin, I want to know color, condition, and temperature. Right? This is my warm pink and dry or my cool, pale, and diaphoretic. Right? So it's skin, color, condition, and temperature. And then our number six down here, right? Sometimes we say, I'm going to pause at the end and I'm going to assess POT. I want to determine my patient's priority, right? And I want to verbalize, I want to physically label them as a certain priority, one, two, or three. O is oxygen. Do they need oxygen or not? As soon as I identify a problem with my breathing, that's the appropriate point to administer my oxygen. So priority oxygen, and then T is transport. So my transport considerations. And with my transport considerations, I want to know things like, when am I going to transport? How long am I going to stay on the scene? And where am I going to transport, right? Am I going to go to a specialty referral center? Can I go to my closest hospital? And am I going to go lights and sirens, or can I go uh, routine response, okay? So POT, and at that point, I'm out of my primary assessment, and I move into my secondary assessment. So when I move into my secondary assessment, what I often say is that the vehicle that I use to get me from my primary assessment into my secondary assessment, so my secondary assessment, the vehicle that I use to travel from one to the other is vital signs. Okay, so when I ask for vitals, uh, it's not me taking the time to, uh, to take my, the vitals myself. I simply ask a partner, partner, do me a favor. Please obtain a full set of vital signs to include, and then I list whatever vital signs I want. Blood pressure, pulse rate, pulse socks, blood sugar, pupils, lung sounds, whichever vitals I would like my partner to get, I simply ask them to do that, and now I'm into my secondary assessment. So my secondary assessment, this is my, these are the questions that I ask my patient. Right? I ask, I check sample. Uh, S is signs and symptoms. A is allergies. M is medications. P is past or pertinent medical history. We'll say med history. L is last oral intake. And E is events, right? Events, whoops. Events that led to the 911 call. What were you doing when this, when this came on, when you started to experience this problem? So I ask my patient these questions. It is really important to ask all of these questions, right? The stereotypical one that we find hangs people up sometimes is, when they've gone through this process and they find a patient who has a narrowing uh, airway, I can hear audible lung sounds as I approach and I hear, these, I hear this wheezing and I say, wow, wheezing, this must be an asthmatic patient. And when I get to, and I ask some of these questions and I say, okay, uh, signs and symptoms, I hear you wheezing, I see your trouble breathing. Uh, a for allergies, yes, I have an allergy, but I also have an albuterol medication. Right? As we learn next, it's important to do our full uh, investigative process because if I simply write this off and say, you know what, you're wheezing, this must be an albuterol problem, and I treat for the albuterol, but never do a physical exam as we'll do in just a moment to catch the fact that the patient has hives in association with an allergy that they might have, right? 
it, it, it leads us to possibly get derailed or sidetracked and mistreat, the, and mistreat the illness. So there's my sample. And then I also ask OPQRSTU. And OPQRSTU, people pigeonhole this often into just asking about pain. But the important thing to understand is this doesn't just go well with pain. This goes well with any type of distress. So O is onset, right? How did it come on? Did it come on very suddenly? Did it come on over time? Were you out back mowing the lawn, pushing the lawnmower, and suddenly you got chest pain? Or were you sitting in a chair and you've had chest pain that's gotten worse and worse over the course of the last three days? So onset is how did it come on? P is provocation. Provocation. Has anything that you've identified make it better or worse? Q is quality. In your words, you tell me how this makes you feel. R is radiation. Right? Does your discomfort travel anywhere else? Are you experiencing discomfort in any other part of your body? S is severity, scale of 1 to 10. Right? Uh, 10 being the worst, 1 being nothing. Where are you on this scale? T is time. So the difference between onset and time, onset is how did it come on? Time is how long have you been dealing with this? How long has this been going on? And U is what have you done prior to my arrival to try to help yourself. If you're having chest pain, did you take the aspirin? If you're having an asthma attack, did you already take your albuterol inhaler once? Things like that. Like I said, people think often that this goes really well with pain, right? I'm having chest pain. How did it come on? Does anything make it better or worse? Uh, how does this pain make you feel? How does it feel to you? Does that pain travel anywhere? Scale of one to 10, 10 being your worst chest pain ever, one being nothing, where are you at on that scale? Time, how long has this been going on? And what have you done prior to me getting here to try to help yourself? But this also works for discomfort. If I'm having an asthma attack, how did it come on? Rapidly or gradually? Anything you've identified make it better or worse? Tell me in your words how this distress feels to you, physically how it feels. Radiation, do you have any other discomfort anywhere in your body? Severity, scale of one to 10. 10 being your greatest discomfort, one being nothing. Where are you out on that scale? Time, how long have you been dealing with this asthma attack? And what have you done before I got here to try to help yourself? The other thing in the secondary assessment that's really important to realize, and this is what I was talking about earlier, is that we must do some type of physical exam. I have to do a physical exam. Let's say our patient is having that asthma attack and they're struggling to breathe. I still want to do a focused physical exam on the part of their body that, that they're complaining about. If I'm having difficulty breathing and my chest feels tight, I want to expose the chest and belly and I want to look and I want to make sure, for example, that my patient isn't, uh, doesn't also display hives or anything like that. So I do a really quick focused exam and the things that I always check for in any physical exam is always my DCAT BTLS. And with DCAT BTLS, it's deformities, contusions, abrasions, abrasions, punctures, penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, swelling. Now, what's, what works out time-wise, the reason I asked for vitals here, prior to me going through this investigative process with my patient, is that realistically, it's going to take my partner about five-ish minutes, three to five minutes, to obtain all of my vital signs. Even if we have a life pack or an automated blood pressure cuff, we've got to get the cuff out, place it on the patient's arm, push the button, let it inflate, and do all these things, as well as checking all those other vital signs that we asked for. So this takes about three to five minutes. It's going to take me about that amount of time to go through this process. We should arrive at this point in time right about the same time, and then I'm ready to choose an avenue of treatment. Now I can say, I believe without any doubt in my mind that you are suffering from this medical condition. This is how I'd like to treat it. This is the protocol which I'd like to travel down. If I'm going to administer a medication, we always talk about our RPM triple D. This is one of the acronyms. It's a little bit more simplified, uh, a little bit simpler to remember than the five rights of patient medication administration. RPM triple D, if I administer a medication, stands for route, patient, medication, right? And then is it within date? Is it the correct dose? And then after I give it, I'm going to document in my report how, when I gave it to you.
Okay? So the right route, the right patient, the right medication, the right date, dose, and document. So what this normally looks like is the right route. Let's say I'm going to administer nitroglycerin. I say it's nitroglycerin. My route is sublingual. I know you're the correct patient to receive it because number one, it's prescribed to you. And number two, you are displaying signs and symptoms to me consistent with acute coronary syndrome. The medication is nitroglycerin. It's within date, it's not, uh, it's not expired. My dose is 0.4 milligrams sublingual. And then after I assist you with this, I'm gonna document this. Um, I'm gonna document that I gave it to you. And then after I've done this, and after I've gone through my scene size up, my primary assessment, I've gotten my vitals, my secondary assessment, I've chosen my treatment, I've done a physical exam, maybe I've, done, I've administered a medication, it's important to reassess. And remember that we reassess our patients, our stable patients, our priority three patients every 15 minutes, and our unstable patients, any higher priority patients, are assessed every five minutes. All right, so when we talk about assessing our trauma patient, our rapid trauma assessment, it is still important to complete this entire patient assessment process. I still want to go through my scene size up before I approach the scene. I still want to do my primary assessment. And why? Because my primary assessment is when I find and fix immediate life threats. So I go through my primary assessment. I make sure we're good there. I determine my priority oxygen and transport. I ask my partner to, to take vitals. I try to determine this information. If the patient's unresponsive, I try to ask any bystanders, any family members, that, anybody that might know the patient that might be able to answer these questions, but I still try my best to get these questions answered. Now I'm going to do a physical exam, only my patient can't tell me exactly where they hurt. So I can't, remember in my medical assessment, this is a focused physical exam. In the absence of my patient being able to tell me what's going on, I now have to do a full rapid trauma assessment. Okay, And my rapid trauma assessment, that's my complete head-to-toe trauma assessment. It's an investigation where I physically go head to toe on my patient and look for any abnormalities, any injuries that the patient may be dealing with. So if I keep this acronym in mind and if I generically draw my patient here, remember that any part of the body that I get to, I'm always going to check for DCAP BTLS. So during my rapid trauma assessment, I still always have DCAP BTLS to check on any part of the body that I come to. So for example, when I'm at the head, I start at the very top of the head and I check for any DCAP BTLS, deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, swelling. And that encompasses the majority of physical abnormalities that I can find with my patient. The thing is, as we travel through the patient's body, so the head and the neck and the torso, and the, the pelvic area, I just have some additional considerations to, to try to look for. So when I'm at the top of my head, I always check for crepitus. And remember, crepitus is that grinding, that uh, the, uh, grinding of the bones, any fractured bones, any crushed bones that are grinding together. I check for crepitus. When I get to my orifices, so my head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat kind of stuff, I always check my orifices for blood, cerebrospinal fluid, foreign material, okay. Um, I'm checking in the mouth and nose for any vomit or bleeding, okay. And then when I check the face, when I get around the eyes, I check for raccoon eyes. Behind the ears, I'm going to check for battle signs. These things are uh, um, indicative of, um, of skull fractures. Okay. But I've still checked for DCAP BTLS and then these additional items. When I get to this area, the neck, the neck and throat area, uh, I check my neck veins for jugular vein distension. I check for nice midline trachea, whoops, midline trach, to make sure it's not deviated. Remember, deviated trachea is a late sign of uh, tension pneumothorax. So I also check for medical alert tags around the neck, uh, the necklace with any medical alert tags. I check for cervical spine step off or alignment. Okay, and then as I continue to travel down my patient's body here, uh, the next in line is where my clavicles would be. So when I check clavicles, I check clavicular stability. And I'm just checking to make sure that they're nice and stable, still providing that strut for that large pectoral muscle. 
So I check to make sure that my clavicles are intact and stable, and if they are, this is my appropriate time to place my seat collar. Remember that the, the hard plastic ridge of that seat collar rests on this collarbone here. So if this is not stable, I wouldn't place a seat collar. You simply take a towel or a blanket, make a roll, place it around the neck, and provide C-spine stabilization that same way. Okay? But if it's stable, I place my seat collar, and then I continue moving down the torso. When I get to the torso, one thing that's really important to understand is that what I'm not doing here is I don't get to this level of the torso and then travel down the limbs. Instead, it's much simpler if I continue in a straight line down the patient's body, continue or complete this assessment, and then I choose a limb. And I go down one leg, and then I go down the other leg. And I'm always comparing one to the other. So what I also don't do is I don't do one leg and then go up to that arm and then go back to the other leg and then this arm. Right? What I want to do is complete this leg, immediately go to the mirrored side, complete this leg, and then I go to the upper limbs and I go this arm and then compare it to this arm, okay? So when I'm at this point in my rapid trauma assessment and I'm assessing the chest, I'm still going to check the chest wall and abdomen for any DCAP BTLS. And with the chest, I'm also checking for good intact bilateral chest wall movement, uh, bilateral chest movement, Okay. I'm checking for any sucking chest wounds, any flail segments, sucking chest wounds, flail segments, okay, or any other chest wall abnormalities there. When I get to the abdomen area, okay, I'm also going to check for any guarding. Right? Does my patient wince or guard when I uh, try to palpate all four quadrants of the abdomen? Remember, all of this is very hands-on. So I'm always placing hands on the patient's, uh, on the, the region of the body that I'm assessing and it, while I look for these things. So I'm looking for any guarding. I'm looking for tenderness in the abdomen. I'm looking for any rigidity, right? These are things that, uh, th this uh, signifies bleeding into the belly space, uh, reg guarding, rigidity, tenderness, uh, distension. And how about a pulsatile mass, right? But remember, I've also already checked my DCAP BTLS. When I get to the pelvic area, right, I'm going to check for buff, B-U-F-F, -F. okay, B-U-F-F, -F. and this is blood, urine, feces, or foreign objects. Okay. Once I've done that, I've checked my DCAP BTLS. I've checked this buff in my pelvic area. I also check pelvic stability. So when I check pelvic stability, right, there's a couple of things we do here. So under pelvic stability, stability, the two tests are, right, we can check for crepitus. So I can, uh, I can put pressure on the iliac crest. I can place pressure inwards and rotate downwards. If at any time during any pelvic assessment I feel crepitus, I stop that exam and I move on to my next body area because there's a lot of blood, a lot of uh, vital areas around this, uh, the pelvic region that I don't want to further irritate if they already have a significant injury. So pelvic stability, I'm going to check that iliac crest movement. And then I can also place pressure on the pubic symphysis. Symphysis. Okay, and by placing pressure on the pubic symphysis, I take the heel of my hand and I simply place it on the pelvic bone just below the umbilicus and I'm going to put pressure straight down and then rotate slightly forward. And again, if I feel any crepitus, any abnormalities, any DCAP BTLS in this area, I simply stop the exam and I move on to my limbs. Okay, all right, so I've checked that area and now I go, I'm going to choose a leg and I come down this leg and I check for my DCAP BTLS. When I get all the way distal down here, uh, to the distal end of this limb, I'm always going to check pulse, motor, and sensory. Some curriculum now shows this as circulation, motor function, and sensory. Uh, and then I 
travel to the other limb, the other lower limb, and I travel down here and I check DCAT BTLS, I check pulse motor sensory distal down here. And now I come to my upper limbs and I check DCAT BTLS down this limb, and when I get to the distal end here, I check my pulse motor sensory, and then I travel to the other side and I check for DCAT BTLS and then pulse motor sensory. Really the only part of this discussion that's left is, as my patient is supine and I've still got somebody holding C-spine, I still need to check the posterior portion. So this is when, with the help of my partners on scene, we log roll the patient, I check the posterior, posterior, and as I check the posterior, I'm looking for any cervical spine mislocation. When I get to the pelvic area, I'm checking for buff in that uh, posterior pelvic area, and I'm also checking the entire posterior portion for DCAT BTLS. And when I log roll, that's also a great time to listen to my posterior uh, lung sounds, and then I log roll back onto the backboard and go through my spinal Im immobilization process. All right, so we've discussed the patient assessment process. Now I'm just going to demonstrate it in a medical patient. Uh, how simply we flow through these compartmentalized segments of this patient assessment process. So let's say I'm dispatched. This is going to be my 50-year-old male uh, who's complaining of a little bit of chest pain and shortness of breath. Uh, so as I'm dispatched, I want to uh, evaluate, is my scene safe? I'm going to have my BSI, so my gloves, my surgical mask, and whatever else I need. Uh, number of patients, I'm going to have one patient that I'm dispatched for. Is it a mechanism of injury or nature of illness? Well, there's no obvious signs of trauma, so I'm going to assume that it's a nature of illness call. Additional resources, because it's a chest pain, shortness of breath call, I'm going to, um, I'm going to consider the fact that I might need an ALS resource, and then if I need any manpower or anything like that, once I show up, I'll ask for that. And C-spine precautions, it's a nature of illness call. There's no signs of trauma, so I'm not going to take C-spine precautions at this time. So now I'm out of my scene size up. I go into my primary. So I say, as I approach my patient, I'm going to form my general impression. So I have an adult male uh, sitting upright in a chair. He doesn't appear to be any, in any great distress at the moment. And I know I've been dispatched for chest pain and shortness of breath. So I move on to my level of consciousness. My level of consciousness, I approach, I establish a rapport with my patient, I introduce myself, I say, hello, sir, I'm with the fire department. Uh, I understand that you're having some chest pain today. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on? And when he answers, and it, let, let's say uh, he tells me, yeah, I've been having this chest pain and shortness of breath. I was out back mowing my lawn uh, when I started having this uh, chest pain, so I came in and called 911. Okay, great. Well, this answers, this automatically answers some questions for me. I established a, a bit of a rapport with him. I introduced myself. He spoke back to me. He answered me appropriately. So I know that he's, his level of consciousness is alert. I know his airway's open because he spoke to me. Now I'm going to take a very brief moment to assess his breathing. I want to know rate, rhythm, and quality. So as he's sitting here, I watch his chest wall movement, and I notice that he's not breathing erratically. His rate seems to be within normal limits. And as I approach, I don't hear any audible lung sounds without my, stethos uh, my stethoscope. So I say his rate is within normal limits, his rhythm is regular, and quality is good. I don't hear any adventitious lung sounds without a stethoscope. Now I move on to circulation. Sir, do you mind if I just borrow your wrist for a second? So I check for a pulse. Remember, if this were um, the real world scenario, I would either remove the watch or travel to the side where he doesn't have the watch on. So I evaluate his pulse once I feel his pulse. All right, I get it established there. Okay, I've got a, I'm checking rate, rhythm, and quality. His rate appears to be within normal limits. The rhythm is nice and regular, and I have a good, strong distal radial pulse here. So there's my circulation, and while I'm here, I note his skin. I'm going to check color, condition, and temperature. So color, he's got uh, pink skin, he is warm, and currently he is non-diaphoretic. So at the moment, I'm going to pause and determine my patient's priority oxygenation requirements and transport. Priority, currently, I'm going to say I have a priority two chest pain patient. I know he's complaining of chest pain and a little bit of shortness of breath. Since I've been dispatched and he says to me he has a little bit of shortness of breath, I'm going to give him some O2. I'll worry about the vital signs later. So I'm going to give him a nasal cannula, four liters per minute. We'll start that. And uh, transport, uh, I'm probably going to transport to a cardiac intervention center once I'm finished with my assessment and my initial treatment. So I move on to my secondary uh, assessment. I say, partner, do me a, a favor, get a full set of vital signs to include blood pressure, heart rate, pulse ox. Uh, we'll get a respiratory rate. 
Um, blood sugar is probably not indicated for this patient. We'll get lung sounds, and you can check pupils as well. So now I've got a full set of vitals coming, so I'm going to move into my secondary assessment. I say, okay, signs and symptoms. Sir, I realize that I've been dispatched here for chest pain and shortness of breath. Can you tell me exactly what's going on today? And he repeats the same story. He says, yeah, I was mowing my lawn out back. Uh, I have a push mower, and as I was pushing, um, I started to get short of breath, and I noticed that my chest felt really heavy, and I had some pain there. I said, okay, well, there's my signs and symptoms. Sir, do you have any allergies? No, I don't have any allergies. Um, do you take any medications? And he says, yeah, sure, I have all this whole list of medications. I have uh, high cholesterol medications. I have this nitroglycerin medication. I've got uh, high blood pressure medications. And I say, okay, so I've noted his medications. And then I'm going to ask a, a, another qualifier to that, have you taken any of those medications today? And let's say he says, well, I take my blood pressure uh, medication in the morning. I have not taken the nitroglycerin yet. And I say, okay, great. Uh, how about any past pertinent medical history? And he says, sure, I have, uh, I've been diagnosed with angina. I had a stent placed two years ago. I've got high cholesterol and high blood pressure. Uh, and I say, okay, uh, so there's my past pertinent medical history. Last oral intake, when did you last have anything to eat or drink? And let's say he says, I had lunch about an hour ago. And I say, okay, great, what did you have for lunch? And he says, I had a turkey sandwich, some chips, and a Coca-Cola. And I say, okay, is that a normal meal for you? And he says, yes, it is. I say, okay, uh, last oral intake. So E for events. Now you said that you were uh, push mowing your lawn prior to getting this chest pain. Anything else significant about that event? He says, nope. I was just push mowing my lawn when I started to get this uh, dull pressure pain in my chest and having some shortness of breath. I say, okay, so the onset, I know that you said you were mowing your lawn when this came on. Was it very sudden? Was it gradual? How did it, how did it kind of come on to you? And he says, nope, it, was, it came on within the course of about 60 seconds of mowing my lawn, and it's been there ever since. I said, okay, sir, uh, provocation, has anything that you've identified since it started make it better or worse? And he says, well, uh, I came inside, I sat down in this chair, it's gotten a little bit better, but it's still present. All right, radiation, are you having any discomfort anywhere else, or does this pain travel to any part of your body? And he says, you know, now that you mention it, yeah, I've got a little bit of pain in my left shoulder and in the left side of my neck as well. And I say, okay, severity on a scale of one to 10. 10 being your worst chest pain ever, one being nothing at all, where are you on the scale? And he says, well, my pain is currently at 8 out of 10. I say, okay, time. How long has this been going on? When did this start? And he says, about 15 minutes ago, right before me calling 911. And then I say, okay, have you done anything prior to me arriving? Have you done anything to try to help yourself before I got here? And let's say for this case, he says, well, the dispatcher uh, told me to take 324 milligrams of aspirin, which I've done, uh, and that's it other than just sitting here. Okay, so now I need to do a focused physical exam. Sir, I know you're complaining of chest pain and some shortness of breath. I just want to take a look at your chest to give you a thorough assessment. I would expose the chest. Hands on, I'm checking for DCAP BTLS across all the areas of the chest. And I say, okay, sir, as I press, does this cause you any greater pain or does your pain stay the same? And he says, nope, my pain still stays the same whether you press or not. And I've checked for my DCAP BTLS. And I do one more little qualifier here with my chest pain. I say, sir, do me a favor. If you take a big breath in, when you take that big breath in, does that ch change your chest pain at all, or does it consistently stay the same? And he says, nope, it consistently stays the same no matter how I breathe. So now I've done my physical exam. Uh, I've done all of my secondary assessment. My partner has gotten my vitals. I get my vital signs to qualify whether or not I can administer medications. If I'm going to administer medications, I do my RPM triple D. And then after I've assessed and treated my patient, I go on to my continuing reassessment throughout the duration of the call.